Why attention management? Why focus on that? Our biggest challenge in the 21st century is not that we don't have enough time, right? We, we've we all had days where we think, oh my gosh, I that was such a good day. I got so much done. And we all have days where we think, oh my gosh, I was busy all day and somehow I got nothing done. And in those two instances, we had the same 24 hours. And so we have all the time we need to achieve the things that we want. I believe that our biggest challenge in the 21st century is that we have too many distractions. And you can't solve a distraction problem with a time solution. The antidote to distraction is attention. And so this idea that if we just manage our time better, that will solve all of our problems is just not helping us. I mean, that's about scheduling and prioritizing and scheduling and prioritizing is great. But if you are distracted every minute or two, it doesn't matter. And so it's time to retire that phrase time management. And if all of us start thinking about attention management, how we are managing our attention. And if we start thinking it in our head, if we start saying it to other people, and if leaders start writing it in job descriptions, then that raises awareness about distraction. If you're hearing somebody talk all the time about attention management, attention management, then you might start to think, oh, maybe I should have put my phone on silent. Oh, maybe I should have... um, you know, close my office door. Maybe I should not have let that person interrupt me. And then people start to change their behaviors. And when they change their behaviors, everything, um, that that's the first step, right? Changing behavior, awareness is the first step in changing any behavior. Do you think this problem where at whatever point you've identified it to be at, do you see this getting worse or do you feel optimistic that it will get better? I absolutely think it's going to get worse. Um, I think that, I think that the good news is that humans adapt, but I think we have a couple of problems. The first is that really the world is conspiring to steal our attention from us, right? It is, um, It is imperative that businesses get our attention. That is the new currency. And so there are all these new ways of stealing our attention, right? Technologists are now not only studying technology, they are studying cognitive psychology and behavioral science, trying to manipulate our behaviors so that they can capture our attention. So the world is conspiring against us. <laughs> so that is one problem. Another problem is that I feel like we have just sort of thrown up our hands and said, well, this is just the way the world is, right? This, I, I mean, we just have to figure out how to get by being constantly distracted all the time. But as I tell my audiences, I reject that notion And I invite everyone to reject that notion because we are the only ones who can control our attention. If if it is even possible to control our attention, we are the ones who have to do it. Each of us, at least in theory, has complete control over our attention. And in truth, we can only be distracted if we allow ourselves to be distracted. But I think that we have forgotten that. And we have all of these stories that we tell ourselves about why, why we need to check our email every minute and why, and they are not false stories. It is, it does feel like, you know, every new message that comes in might be a critical emergency. So how can I be away from my email for any period of time? Because what if I miss something truly important? And that is a problem. However, We are not our best selves in the one or two minute increments that we get between switching all day. Research shows that we switch our attention about every minute. And that does not make for our best selves. It does not give us the ability to truly muster the full range of our knowledge and our wisdom and our skills and our abilities. So so this sort of collective like throwing up our hands, I think, is part of the problem. And I don't think we've done that intentionally on purpose. I think like most habits, 
that those behaviors have come about over time out of necessity without intention. And so we have to be reminded that it doesn't have to be this way and that we don't have to give in. So I think that's the second problem. And I think the third problem is just the pace of business and the pace of technology development is is just getting faster and faster and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. And so this belief in our own ability to manage our attention is going to only be harder and harder to maintain. Now, I do think that there is a pendulum swing and there might continue to be one back toward mindfulness and presence and meditation. And I think that's getting a lot more um, notice and involvement than it used to. And so that's a good thing. And maybe that will continue. But I do think we have an uphill battle and I don't see it getting better anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And I feel like the system within which we work is also a bit of a problem. Like I no longer am in a nine to five system. I now have, I run my own business. But again, as I said, like it has so many varied demands. Like I would like to go through an entire day just writing, but I can't do that. I have to post online. I have to send out newsletters. I have, sometimes I get messages that I have to respond to. And those responses are usually lengthy because people are sharing emotional problems and stuff like that. And when I was in a nine to five, there were so many meetings interrupting my work that the meetings that would be almost and like a good 70% of the time, the meetings would be just discussing points that could have been covered in an email. and. But when you get back to your desk, that meeting has sucked out so much of your energy that it's just harder to focus. And you think, oh, let me just get a cup of coffee. Let me just get something to eat. So I feel like the system is also at issue here. It's not just the people. I don't know if you agree with me or not. Well, I think part of the system that you are describing is sort of self-imposed, right? So again, back to these stories that we tell ourselves. And you're right. It feels It feels like we can't. Do, we can't, for example, spend an entire day writing. But given that you run your own business, yeah. Yeah. if you wanted to create a schedule where every Tuesday and Thursday you were not posting online or somebody else, or you schedule posts or somebody else was doing it for you and you put an out of office on your message and you put your devices on do not disturb, you could arrange your schedule to to, to do that if you truly wanted to. Now, I do think that we tend to make our, our focus times too long. Now, we, we need to sort of describe what that means, right? So you can't, obviously, even if you controlled your email and you put your out of office message and you scheduled everything, right? And you arranged it so that you could spend the whole day writing. You really couldn't spend the whole day writing. You would have to take a break and you would have to get some coffee and you would have to, you know, use the restroom and you would have to get up and stretch and move your body, right? And so so there's sort of two um two levels, right? The first level is how can you arrange your life to have the schedule that you can that you want. But then the second thing is when you do block out that focus time that you make sure to consider your physical needs and and figure like I will I will go for about an hour right and you need to be a little flexible because if you're on a roll at the end of that 60 minutes you certainly want to keep going until you get to a logical stopping point but you do want to expect that at least once every hour or so you mindfully get up Take care of yourself, have something to eat, drink some water, stretch your body, move around a little, you know, those kinds of things. So I think what you said we is very common, right? We behave as if we are the victims of our environment. And in truth, we really do have more control over our environment than than we exert most of the time. Yeah. I absolutely 100% can see that point to you. You are right. And thank you for reminding me as well as my listeners of that because you are right. You're absolutely right. I could if I wanted to block like long periods of time just for my writing. I mean, I have this notebook here on my desk, which is filled with schedules. Like I would make timetables 
<laughs> to work. And I can't remember the last time I was actually able to stick to a timetable. I'm absolutely the right person to be having these conversations. So let's start with the possible solutions. But before we go deeper into that, I want to ask you, like, considering what you've just shared about how carefully we should be scheduling our periods of focus, where does deep focus come into this? Because that's something that gets discussed a lot in entrepreneurial and creative circles. Yeah. So there are a couple of levels of deep focus, right? There is effortful concentration, right? I am working very hard to stay focused on what I'm doing. And we need that. But the other level is flow, which is a a state that our brain moves us into on its own, right? We cannot enter that on demand. But the only way that we might enter that on demand is one, in the absence of distraction, and two, very likely when we are actively trying to focus. Once we, when we sit down and we eliminate all of our distractions and we say, I'm absolutely going to do this thing and I'm not going to let anything else interrupt me we build up what I call that brain power momentum, right? Where we, we get into that thing that we're doing and then we might get lucky enough that our brain will tip us into flow. Now, the psychologists say that there are two other factors that, that are required for flow. And one is that the task that we are engaging in is sufficiently interesting to us sufficiently interesting and engaging. Otherwise, we will get bored and we won't get into flow. And the other is that it is sufficiently challenging, but not beyond our capabilities. Because if it's too hard, if it's beyond our capabilities, then we'll get frustrated and we won't get into flow. But if we think about the highest and best use of our time during our jobs, right? Those things that make us good at what we do. If you think about it, that's exactly the that's exactly the right conditions for flow, right? We are hired because we can do it. But in order to really apply ourselves fully, we we need to have time to get into it. And it's not beyond our capabilities. And it probably is sufficiently interesting, at least many parts of our jobs, unless you hate every single part of your job, then that is probably going to to prevent flow. But most of us enjoy at least some aspects of our job. And so when we're doing those things, it is sufficiently engaging that we will get into flow, but not too challenging that we will get into flow. But the missing ingredient that is up to us is the absence of distraction. And that's that's what we we miss most of the time. Okay, if I'm a kid and I'm asking you for steps to go into the flow state, like step one, step two, step three, what would those be? Well, I guess it depends on how young the kid is, but... <laughs> okay, okay, like just, just a young teenager, perhaps, someone who really needs to study hard, preparing for exams, perhaps. Okay, so that requires some level of executive control, which is hard for kids because that part of our brain doesn't function, doesn't fully develop until we are into our 20s. But, but kids can study, I think, a few, a few ways to do it. One, and this works for adults as well, one is to engage other people. A lot of people talk about an accountability partner, but I don't I don't like to think about it that way because when somebody says accountability partner, it makes me think of somebody who's going to wag their finger at me and be like, "Did you do what you said you were going to do?" right? That and that's not really what I mean. What I mean is you must know somebody else who also needs to study for this exam, and maybe if you get together someplace quiet, you will hold each other to we're going to study now. And then maybe you can quiz each other and maybe you could do it in a way that is more interesting to you than sitting in a room by yourself with nothing but your your books or your materials in front of you, which is hard, especially if it's a topic that you don't care about. So 
for a, a teenager, I would say engaging other people is is one of the best ways to do it. It's, especially somebody who has this a similar level of commitment that you do. Don't don't enlist your friend who doesn't really care about the class and doesn't really care about their grades and is just going to talk the whole time, right? Find a friend who is serious, as serious as you are about studying and getting a good grade on the exam. And for us, like people like us who are working, you said the task has to be engaging, challenging, but not too challenging, not beyond your capabilities. Anything else like where, how would I section my time if I am, because you also mentioned that um, brain power uh, momentum would what was the term you used? Yep. So brain power momentum. Okay, yep. So that sounds like something that would require some a prolonged period of time, like working for a prolonged period of time. So help me understand how I would schedule if I'm trying to consciously trying to go into flow or at least trying to build that practice that would eventually take me there. Then what would that practice look like? Yeah, I think the first thing is that you have to be intentional. You have to decide. Now you can... I do think, especially if other people make appointments on your schedule, like if you share Outlook calendars at work or something, you do need to block out time for work. But I would say for the most part, just call it work time, right? Look out for a week or two, block out your schedule for work time, you know, an hour or two here and there throughout your week. Don't try to plan exactly what you're going to do when you're blocking out your calendar. But then... As the time approaches, okay, I've got my work time coming up in 20 minutes. Then go to your task list, assuming that you that you keep one, and decide what am I going to do? Do I have all the information I need to do this? How much of this do I need to do, right? Am I go- going to finish it in the next 30 or 45 or 60 minutes? Or am I just going to bring it to a stopping point? Once I get to this point, then I will either take a break or I will stop completely and I will move on to something else. So being intentional about what you're going to do, because it is important leading up to that blocked out time, because otherwise we just, you know, right, we get out of the meeting, we just finished that meeting, it's 10.01, and I said at 10 o'clock I was going to focus, what was I going to focus on? I don't know, but I have all these emails that just came in from that last meeting while I was in that last meeting, and let me just check those before before I really start working, right? And then before you know it, the whole time is gone. And most people also don't manage their to-do list very well. Most people keep the things that they need to do in some combination of their brain, sticky notes, a notebook, appointments with themselves on their calendar, a dry erase board in their office, flagged emails. So then it's like, all right, I've got 30 minutes to get something done. What should I do? Right. And they're looking around and, oh, I know I'll do that. Oh, but wait, before I do that, oh, I need to do that. And oh, wait, here's that sticky note where I wrote that thing. Right. And once again, the time is lost. So I teach a whole process for that uh, called the Empowered Productivity System. It's a workflow management system. But unless you have a good handle on what you need to do, you're going to be very distracted. And then you have to mindfully approach that blocked out time to decide what you're, how you're going to spend that time. Okay. A lot of online resources talk about and productive, productivity gurus talk about this. Like they would mention that you have to be in the same state every time. Like if every day I am doing this practice where I'm trying to go to the flow state or hopefully building up to it over a period of time, then I should make sure that I'm sitting at the same in the same place. My physical state is very similar every day. Is that true? It is true. It It is not required, but it certainly makes it easier. That's Those are principles of habit creation, right? So if you want to get into the habit of having deep work time, as Cal Newport calls it, right? Deep work time every day, then it will be easier to build that habit if you are giving your brain the same environmental cues, right? Habitual cues. So all the habitual cues, what time of day is it? Are there other people around? What's your location? Um, How are you feeling? 
if you can manage all of those habitual cues to be the same or similar, then you will train your brain, oh, when it's this time of day and I feel like this and there are no other people around and this this is what I'm supposed to do during this time, then that does make it easier to um, to create a habit out of that focus time for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause I mentioned that, you know, I'm able, to, I, I get distracted with work. Everything that you mentioned, like everything you've described up to this point applies to me, <laughs> but I'm able to meditate for long periods of time, but I meditate in a different room. Like there's a, we have a temple in our house. I always sit on the floor on a, uh, I always sit on the floor and there's a ritual to the meditation. Like I would go in there, I would sweep the temple, I would light the light of the, uh, or in English, what would you call it? Like light a lamp. And then I would recite my first mantra, then my second. And so, so it's very ritualistic. So what you're saying actually makes so much sense. It's not like I don't get distracted, like the thoughts are still flowing, but I stay in that state and I still keep going. You have trained your, trained your brain and and so that applies to lots of things. People who have insomnia, for example, um, advice for insomniacs is is similar, right? Have a bedtime ritual. Have you know, take a warm bath or do some light stretching. Turn down the lights. Eliminate the screens. Try to go to bed at the same time every day. And basically, what you're doing is you're teaching your brain. In, the, in this kind of situation, this is what we do. Whether that is work deeply or meditate or sleep or whatever, it, or exercise or whatever it is you need to do, the more you can sort of teach your brain to engage in that behavior, basically what happens is that the behavior becomes habitual. And once it's habitual, we don't have to think about it anymore. It just happens automatically. You mentioned empower productivity system. Can we talk about that a little bit more, please? So I think a lot of people don't recognize that the way that we operate, the way that we manage our lives, the way that we, as the kids call it, adult, right, right. <laughs> the way that we adult successfully, that can be systematized. For most people don't have a system. Most people have a collection of behaviors that have come about over time out of necessity without intention, right? I just, right? I just, I read every email as it arrives and I just put an, put a flag on the important ones and I get back to them when I can. And I just jot the, the, the things that come to my mind on a sticky note and I keep those around me. Or I have this notebook that I bring into every meeting with me, right? Those things were not intentional. They were just, I don't know, things are crazy. I guess I'm just going to try this, right? So what most people have is a collection of unintentional behaviors as opposed to a system, which is a collection of behaviors that we have intentionally looked at and said, how am I gonna do this? Is this effective? Does it make sense? And, and what exactly will I do? And so James Clear um, from Atomic Habits says, systems are best for making progress because we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. And so if how you operate is how you achieve all of your goals, then you will, it will get easier if you create what we call a workflow management system. But you could also think of it as a life flow management system because it's, it's how you manage your whole life, how you adult successfully. So a a workflow management system, it's not about apps, it's not about software, it's not about the technology that you use, it's about your behaviors. And so the Empowered Productivity System has six components where six each component reflects a, a collection of behaviors under a certain topic. So one component is attention management which is about your behaviors around distraction and how you manage your attention. Another component is what I call action management, which is about your behaviors around tasks and prioritizing and executing on the stuff you need to get done. 
The third component is communication management, which is your behaviors around how you stay on top of all the communication that you receive and also how you communicate with other people like on a team. The fourth component is your behaviors around burnout and work-life balance because your physical state of burnout is affecting is affecting your outputs, right? And work-life balance is sort of the flip side of that coin because most people get burned out because they work too much. I mean, there are other reasons, right? If you work in a toxic environment and, and those kind of things, but a lot of people just work too much. The fifth component is about behavior change because you need to shine a light on how do behaviors change? How do we form habits? And how do we make it easier for ourselves to adopt the new habits that we want and abandon the old habits that we don't? And then the sixth component is the environment, which I call the culture, which is where I work with teams to say, if our culture does not support our new behaviors, then those behaviors are going to be very hard to adopt. If we don't, for example, if, if we all if we're always emailing each other at all hours of the day and night, it's going to be very hard for each of us to have a good work life balance. If we are always dropping in on each other or chatting, do you have a minute? Do you have a minute? Do you have a minute all day long? Then it's going to be very difficult for each of us to manage our attention and so on. So those are the six components. And what I do with my clients is I we shine a light on the behaviors in each of those six areas. And I give them new behaviors that have been designed with intention that have been proven that they can then learn to adopt. Man, if someone could get all of it right, that, that person would be a, like a... It's transformational yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It's transformational. Yeah. It makes people feel, because it's not just about I get... I achieve more of what's important I'm, because that that's important. So I guess that's, that's, I should back up and say, when I talk about being productive, which is my expertise, I talk about productivity as achieving significant results. That's the definition, achieving significant results. So how much progress you have made on the things that are significant or important to you that's how productive you are in any period of time. And the significance changes with the time horizon. So if I were to ask you at the end of today, what was your most significant result? You'd give me a different answer than if I asked you at the end of the week, what was your most significant result? And if I asked you at the end of the month, what was your most significant result? And at the end of the year, and at the end of the decade, and at the end of your life, what was most significant? And so when I talk about achieving what's most important to us, I really mean anything from the most important item on your to-do list today, all the way to what kind of legacy will you leave behind and what will people think about you when you're gone? You know, what do you want them to think and what kind of impact do you want to have in your time on this earth? And virtually anything else in between that you consider to be important or significant, that's what productivity is about to me. And so how to achieve that, those things become really transformative because what people find, because we're talking about significance on a broad scale, at the micro level, I... I go home from work more often thinking, oh my gosh, that was such a good day. I got so much done, which means I am more energized when I leave work, which means I engage with my family differently than if I am exhausted and worn out and frustrated when I get home, right? So I, so my relationship with my family changes. I have a better work-life balance, which affects my family, and so, and then, and I also feel better about my job. I feel more accomplished. I feel more satisfied. I feel more engaged. I feel more motivated to come back tomorrow and do that again. Right. And then also 
we achieve more of our bigger life goals because now we have time to go to the gym again and to engage in hobbies again and to spend more time with our family and our friends again and to serve on nonprofit boards and volunteer more and and go back to school and engage in those other creative pursuits that we just never had time for before. And so we become just happier all around. All the parts of our lives improve when we get this right. That's my whole mission, right? Most people bring their gifts to the world, right? Through work and through who they are as people and through volunteering and all the things that they do, right? They bring their gifts to the world, but they do it in a way that is exhausting and frustrating and stressful and in a way that is really depleting them day after day after day. And so my mission is to help people bring those gifts to the world in a way that energizes and excites and motivates them so that they can really just do more and and live a full life that was really additive instead of reductive. Yeah, that was beautiful. And that is an important, important definition to note because I can bet anything that this is a struggle and this may be a struggle that people are not even aware of, that productivity is when you ha- are making significant progress, progress that actually matters, that counts towards your bigger goals. Because I remember uh, the first few months of my business, I was doing so much nonsense. I just was not contributing anything. And I was crazy busy. And the busyness was making me think that something's about to happen because look at how much work I'm doing. but No, that was not true. And to this day, I am like, now I'm always noting, oh, this is taking time, but it's actually contributing nothing. Let's take this out. Let's do more of this. That is huge what you just mentioned. I mean, I hope everybody listening like makes a note of it, writes it down, puts it up till they've internalized it because that is huge. And that is so tragic that there are people out there who are working so hard, but, you know, there's nothing like nothing cumulative to it, like no progress that is actually going to take them forward. So that's, that's huge. And I want to go deeper into the components that we have mentioned. But first, I would like to ask you how much of the, the issues that we face, how many of the issues that we face with attention management are down to the way we set our goals? So again, back to James Clear, right? It's, it's easy to set a goal. The only thing you have to do to set a goal is say, I want that, right? I mean, we set goals every day, all day. I want to, I I want to get this done. I want to leave work at lunch today. I want to get home at six o'clock so I can have dinner with my family. I want to, or, you know, I want to run a marathon or I want to go back to school or I want to retire at age 55, or, you know, I want to earn this amount of money, or I want this promotion or whatever it is, right? It is easy, easy to set goals. But how are you going to get there is what matters. So I don't think the goals, the goal setting is a problem. I think the system to get there is where people fail. And, and I think James Claire and I are talking about similar things. He's talking about creating good habits. And what I'm saying is, yes, and I'm going to give you the habits to sort of manage your life by. And then if you can adopt these habits, that is how you will achieve the things. So he's saying you need a system and I'm saying I've got the system for you, which which is he's got a system for creating any kind of habit, which is great. And I'm saying I've got the system for adulting, right? Managing, managing your life successfully. Okay. Do you think there is like consciously everything you're saying, I would want myself and others to work with that process because it's making so much sense to me. And I relate so strongly to it that there is a voice inside me that's telling me here's the solution, right? But I also wonder if there are emotional factors and mindset factors that play here, because sometimes 
and correct me if I'm wrong, please do, because we can have like this beautiful system. We know it's going to work. And people like we talk about self-sabotage. We talk about something that happens that just we we're still unable to stick to it. Even if we stick like we stick to it for 15 days, those are 15 glorious days. And then we go and do something to mess it all up. Does that happen or is that just me? No, it absolutely happens. And that comes down to um, it, it is always easier to fall back into our old comfortable patterns, right? Because by definition, stasis is comfortable. This is what I'm used to, right? People will say to me, oh, it doesn't work for me to have silence when I'm working. I need music. And what that says to me is, no, you're used to music and having music is comfortable to you, but you don't really know if you need it because you've never tried to work without it or you tried for a day and you're like, no, that doesn't work. And so then you decide that you need it, right? So. Um, what I call this is the thread that unravels the sweater, right? You run into some little problem and you, you don't overcome that problem. And so then everything falls apart. And so this is where I have found that having, having a process that someone else has already laid out for you, right? So you could figure out everything that I teach you on your own. You could create, you could cobble your own process together and you could document it and you could decide that it works great and you're going to do it, but then you're going to run into some problem and there's no one to ask because you made it yourself. So how do I solve that? Oh, I don't know. That's hard. And so then you're just like, I'll figure that out later, I guess. And then things just start to fall apart. So that's where I tell my client, I, I include a, a kind of a follow-up process in all of my engagements. And I tell people, once you run into that problem, reach out to me and I will help you overcome it because I've heard it all. And I have an answer for you. So you just need to ask me or you need to look in my resources and you will find how to overcome that problem. But you have to become aware this is the problem. And a lot of times we we think that it's a dead end. We think that, well, I tried it, but it doesn't work. And so it's done, right? So people tell me, oh, I tried to close my office door, but my boss doesn't respect it. And he just walks in anyway. So that doesn't work. I can't do that. Well, could you maybe have a conversation with your boss where you explain why the door is closed and right. And then what, when your boss comes in, what do you do? Do you, maybe you could say to them like, Oh, I'm really sorry, but I'm right in the middle of this thing. I'll be done in just, just a little bit. And then I'll be happy to help you. Right. We just sort of throw up our hands and, well, that doesn't work. Well, hang on. <laughs> Don't give up so easily. That is not a dead end. That is just an obstacle to overcome. Yeah, makes sense. But if you're, you know how when we are making a product, whether that's a content product or a tangible one, we have to build like a client persona, a customer persona. Like we have to uh, think about what who this person is, what their problems are, what their nature is like, what their persona, blah, blah, blah. If you were to describe to me like a truly productive human, considering your experience, and I'm guessing like there are going to be variations to this, they can't be a perfect answer. I'm completely aware of that. But if there is a somebody very productive, what would be the building blocks of this person? Like what would this person be like? What would be some of like absolutely no no habits or anything like that? Can you can you give me something like that? Yeah, I I. I, I um, unfortunately, the answer is no, because <laughs> okay, I like that. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, because all of these skills are learnable, right? It doesn't. People say, "Oh, I'm just not an organized person." Well, no, you've never learned how to be organized, right? That's that's like saying, "I'm just not a golfer." Well, have you ever tried golf? Have you ever taken a lesson? You could be a golfer, right? You could learn how to golf. You could learn anything you want. Maybe you you won't be an Olympian at it, 
but you could get to a place where you can do it, right? It is possible. So I don't have an ideal profile for a productive person, but what I can tell you is that sort of my, I guess, target demographic is typically people between the ages of like late 20s to early 60s who are, you might call them office workers or information workers or knowledge workers or however you want to put it. But if you need a computer to do your job and you have meetings that you go to and you receive communication related to your job and you have discretionary time on your job, meaning you get a whole bunch of stuff that you need to get done, but you, aside from meetings, you decide how it gets done, right? So if so, those are the people who are very busy, also very busy, very driven, very motivated. They have a full life by choice. It's this way because they they want they want to advance their career. They want to have a family. They want to be involved in their community. Right? They want all the things that those are the kind of people who are my clients. So they are the ones who struggle with staying focused for long periods of time. They are the ones who they are the ones who have all of the challenges that I've described, right? I have so much communication. I have so much meetings. I have so much to do. It's so distracting in my work environment, but I want this. I, I want, I want to be present with my family when I go home at the end of the day. I want to advance my career. I want people to think that I'm good at my job, but I also want to be a good human. I want to be a good person. And I have a lot going on and I'm struggling with managing that. Those those are the people. Yeah. No no profile for a person truly focused means the possibilities are endless and open to all. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about procrastination because there are people who work hard. They are focused. But when it comes to critical tasks, they start to procrastinate. Even with the awareness of your deadline looming large, somehow, for some strange reason, you're procrastinating. Yes. Part of that is because procrastination is a habit. So breaking the habit of procrastination is important. So um, there are many ways. Um, I've actually written an article with eight. Eight ways to overcome procrastination. Let's see if on the spot right now I can remember all eight. I'm probably going to forget some. Um, But the first thing is to... Uh, come back to the why, right? Why am I doing this? Why does it matter? What does the outcome look like? What am I actually trying to achieve with this thing? A lot of times it's somebody else's priority. We don't really understand why we have to do it or what it will look like when it's done and how that will help us, right? So clarifying all that at the beginning can overcome that, that sometimes that's a reason for procrastination. There's not enough clarity or motivation. Um, another reason is that we it, we haven't really thought about what exact what exactly we need to do. We haven't broken it down. We ha- it's it's just too big. It's something like you know create the strategy. It's like what does that even mean, right? Or organize the event. I I that sounds hard. I don't have time for that, right? <laughs> like we don't really we haven't broken it down into definable steps. Another way to overcome procrastination is what we talked about involving other people who are um, also, it does, they don't have to be working on the same thing. They could be working on something completely different. But the point is, I need some time to get some stuff done. And so we're going to work together and we're just going to do our work, but we're going to do it together. We have an appointment to do some work together involving other people. Another thing is taking advantage of what I call activation energy. I, I don't just call it that. Other people call it that too. But the idea is one, the hardest part of anything is getting started. And so the easier we can make it to get started, the more likely we are to keep going. And so that's related to the other things. Break it down, but get very clear about what you're doing, understand what the outcome is. So for example, if we say, you know, research competitors, that feels vague and I'm not really sure how to get started, but 
but if we get very clear, you know, uh, Google construction companies in Arizona, right? Then we know how to get started. And then we understand, okay, and I'm going to make a spreadsheet and I'm going to list it out. So I have my spreadsheet open. I've got my browser open, my, my search engine. And now I know exactly what I need to do. And so then once you get started, you are more likely to keep going. So making it very easy to get started and taking advantage of activation energy. Setting intentional cues is another way, which we already talked about in a different context. If you create the environment where your brain goes, oh, I know what we do in this environment, then it makes it very easy. So where do you go to do that kind of work? Are you in the same place? Do you have the same setup? Do you play a certain kind of ideally instrumental music or white noise? Um, how are you feeling? What time of day is it? All of those kind of things. The more cues you can you can set, the more habitual the behavior becomes, and then you won't procrastinate. And then the last two, rewarding yourself. And this could be, it, it should be small rewards along the journey, in addition to perhaps a big reward when a thing is over. But a small reward could just be, I'm dying for another cup of coffee, but I need to get this thing done first. And then I'll get up and get my other cup of coffee, right? Or um, I love having coffee in the morning, but I'm not going to have my coffee until I do my workout. So I'll do my workout and then I get to have my coffee. Or, you know, I want to go take a walk. I want to go take the dog for a walk, but first I need to finish this and then I will take the dog for a walk, right? So tying those little rewards in can help us. And then the last thing is honoring your mood. Sometimes we have planned to do something, but we are just not in the right headspace. It's like when you sit down and you read the same paragraph over and over and over and you still don't know what it says. Yeah, right? yeah. Just time, you need to shift that. So you could still do it, but you have to change your physiology in order to get in the right headspace. So you might say, okay, this isn't working. I'm feeling really tired. So I'm going to go run up and down the stairs for, for three minutes, get my heart rate up, change my physiology, change my physical state, and then I'll be able to sit down and feel more focused about this. But just trying to like push through whatever mood you're in or whatever your energy levels are, it's just not, it's just not going to work. So you either have to shift at that point. Okay. I said I was going to do this spreadsheet, but I just can't do that right now. I'm going to work on this slide deck instead because that feels, I feel a little more creative right now than I do linear right now. So you either need to give up on what your plan was, or you need to change your physiology so that you're in the right headspace and then try again. That makes sense. And that all of it sounds doable. Like these are not difficult to do steps. Where does sleep or lifestyle choices come into this conversation? Yeah. So we, we need in order to achieve more of what's important, right? In order to be productive, we need to make the best use of the resources that we have available to us. But our most important resources are not our time or our money or even our attention. Our most important resources are our body and our minds. And so when we do not take care of our physical bodies, our minds do not work as well. And that's where we get, we make faster decisions, which are not always, you know, more rash decisions. We are not motivated when we are not in a good physical state. We focus more on the short term rather than longer term goals that we've set out for ourselves. So for example, I am starving right now. I said I was going to eat salad for dinner, but I don't have the stuff. I have to go to the grocery store. I have to cut the stuff. I'm too hungry. I'm just going to drive through the drive, the fast food drive through, right? We, we make decisions when we are not in a peak physical state. We make decisions based more on short term, short term outcomes than long term outcomes. So that undermines us. 
when we are physically tired, it is much harder to stay focused. And we really can't muster those resources that we need to do good work. When we are burned out or experiencing any burnout symptoms at all, we're feeling more annoyed about our jobs and the things we need to do. We're feeling more frustrated. So we care less. I don't care about the stupid thing. I, I, I do this every day and I'm so sick of it, right? That's not the right attitude for the best outcomes. So when we are not in good physical state, it really takes away from all other parts of our lives. It makes every goal that we set that much harder to achieve. I feel like also when you like have a overall healthy lifestyle, especially when you work out, I feel like that really is like something that really works for a productive human. Because if you are like 60 minutes of workout or maybe 60 minutes is much too much for some people, but if you're working on like some high intensity workout, I feel like that, at least for me, I feel like that really boosts my focus. It boosts everything, really. It it makes all of our body functions better, right? Our digestion gets better. Our energy levels get better. Our cardiovascular system gets better. Our neurological system gets better. Our cognitive system gets better. So it's our, we really, a lot of times we think about our body our bodies as computers. We can do lots of things all at once. We can work really fast, right? We compare ourselves to computers, but we are not really nothing like computers. Our brains don't work like computers work. But what we are like is a more complicated machine, right? It has to be well oiled and it has to be well tuned and it has to be kept in good shape, right? If you think about a, a maybe like a race car or something, right? All systems have to be in peak condition for the race car to to race as well as it can. Humans are much more like that, like complicated machinery than they are like a computer. How much do you think these blurring boundaries between work and private spaces is playing into this because we are, you know, very much in favor of remote work and I do understand that. That's like it seems to be the way to go right now, especially with how the world is going. But how do you think that is something that works for true productivity? Or is that something that goes against it? No, it absolutely can. Um, and, and it's been a really common question since the pandemic, right? How, how do we do all the things that you teach when we work from home? The same way you do it when you're at work. <laughs> we have different types of distractions when we are home, but we can manage those distractions in the same way that we can manage distractions at work, right? When we're at work, we might be tempted to get up and talk to somebody else. We might be tempted to, um, you know, go to the break room. We might be tempted to um, just spend a lot of our time in emails instead of getting other things done. Well, all the ways that we overcome those challenges at work are the same ways that we overcome the challenges at home. Oh, well, now I'm tempted by the refrigerator instead of talking to my coworkers, or I'm tempted by the load of laundry or emptying the dishwasher or the dog is always bothering me, right? Well, you have control over all of that. Use Use the opportunity to get up and move around your house, like throw in a load of laundry or fold the laundry as a reward for, I just finished that big thing. I've been working on it for the last 40 minutes. I need a break. Okay, get up, move your body, do something around the house, take the dog for a walk, whatever. Um, if you need to get that important thing done and it's not your coworkers interrupting you, it's your cat who keeps walking across your keyboard, right? Well, then maybe you're going to have to put the cat out of the room so that you can get the thing done or give the cat a toy or a treat or something. You know, people say, oh, I put the dog out of the room, but then he whines on the other side of the door. Well, give him a bone, give him something to keep him busy, put him out in the yard, whatever, right? You you can figure this problem out. We, 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 we treat them as like, I just can't. No, you absolutely can. You absolutely can. I feel like 
and and I don't know, a lot of people would hate me for saying this, but and tell me if you disagree with me, but I feel like it's it's what you mentioned like in the beginning where we are blaming the environment. I feel like we are too quick to, as you said, like throw up our hands and be like, okay, this can be done. You have to get some discipline. You have to get some self-control and and then it will work out. At least with remote work, I feel like, or work from home, I feel like you can also support a healthier lifestyle because you no longer have to travel to work. And that means like we talked about how critical sleep is, how critical exercise is, how critical it is for you to maintain a healthy body. That I feel like, yeah, there are risks to everyone doing remote work, if that's even possible, I don't know. But there are so many points in favor of that, that it, it far outweighs the, the disadvantages as long as you're willing to do what is necessary for you to be disciplined and you know stay on top of what your priorities are. I feel like it can be done. Yeah, I I don't I don't love the word discipline. I I tend to bristle to bristle against the word discipline because I think that we we just need to make it easy for ourselves to engage in the behaviors that we want to engage in, and we need to make it hard for ourselves to engage in the behaviors that we want to avoid. And so when we can do that, then we set ourselves up for success in a way that doesn't require discipline. It just happens. But part of that is understanding, part of that is, a big part of that is awareness. Because most of our behaviors are habitual. But until we raise a flag, so people say to me, I close my office door, but my boss walks in. And so closing my door doesn't work. Well, what they have to recognize is they have a habit that when their boss walks in, they just allow their boss to interrupt them. What they need is the awareness in that moment to say, wait, wait, this isn't going to go the way it always does. I'm going to do something different in this situation. And so I think it's not that we don't have discipline. I think it's that we don't, we I talk about shining a light. My job is really to shine a light on your behaviors and say, look, look, look at what you're doing here. Can you change that? You can't. You can change that. And here's how you can change that. But until we shine a light, until somebody shines a light, those corners are dark and we don't see them. Right? So I think it's not that we need so much discipline. I think it's that we need to raise awareness of the behaviors that we're having and we need to create new behaviors that make it easy for us to do the things that we want to do. Yeah. I'm I'm going to do that because yeah. I am always, you know, I'm of the mindset that just knuckle down and do it. And that's that works on the days when everything is perfect. Like I've had a lot of sleep, my meditation went really well, I have full stomach, everything's perfect. It does not work on the days when you have back pain, your period, or you know, there are guests coming. Does not work. <laughs> and that's where a system comes in, right? Because I don't I don't really know. I just knuckle down and plan the event. I don't even know where to start, right? And so if you have a system, your system tells you specifically what to do. And then also you become with your system, it tells you all the places to shine a light. And so you become more aware. Okay, why isn't this working? Well, it's not working because my guests are coming and I have a million things to do. So what am I going to do about that? Okay. I need to do an hour's worth of work, but then if I just do an hour's worth of work, then I can blow off the rest of the day and go get ready for my guests or, right? So just making it top of mind, seeing it as a problem, then you can figure out how to overcome it instead of just sort of trying to push through and not really think about why you're having trouble doing what, what it is you need to do. Yeah. Let me ask you uh, about the broader conversations that are happening around productivity, work culture, and what these younger employees they need like there is an old school thinking a lot of the older ceos talk about 12 hours as possible uh working over the weekend not a problem why not do it you want to be the the boss you have to blah 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 and then there are the younger ones who are talking about that's insane that's toxic what's well, like that get thrown around like we need spa days we need to like check out at this bar it's this is what is healthy what is your 
experience tell me and if you don't want to answer this i'll understand but i just like this is the conversation going in the right direction or is it like i get, i feel like this conversation everyone participating in it gets gets very emotional gets very worked up um because of course it affects everyone i think it's really like any complicated situation right there's a lot of nuance and we tend not to embrace the nuance and we try to apply broad generalizations and and pithy advice and talking points but we need to understand the nuance so for example we think of the older generation as work all the time and this is what you have to do and if you want to succeed and we think of the young generation as you described it right oh but we're, life is so important and we don't work to live and all of those kind of things and i think those are generalizations that don't really tell the truth about about either generation so for example i think that the older generation remembers what it was like before we had internet connected smartphones and so at six o'clock you went home and there was no more work and i mean you maybe could take some work home you might have gotten a phone call but it was much easier to disconnect and so sure work hard even work long hours but when you're not working you are not working and it was easier to do that. So that's sort of a misunderstanding I think about the older generation. I think the younger generation, it's not that they that they don't want to work hard. It's not that they don't want to advance their career. It's just that they don't want to do it from 9 to 5 sitting at a desk the way somebody else wants them to do it. They embrace other parts of life. They do understand how important self-care is. And so I talk a lot about work-life balance, but typically my audiences skew a little bit older, certainly over the age of 30 normally with my corporate clients. But when I do have the occasion to speak to younger people, the message is a little different. Like I think the early stage of your career when you're first starting out is kind of the time to work long hours and learn as much as you can and be super dedicated and prove yourself and learn, right? You should, if you don't have at that point a whole lot of other responsibility, you probably should be spending more time, if not actually working, at least learning about work, right? Learning about your chosen profession and getting good and being as helpful as you can. So my message to younger people is not that you shouldn't take care of yourself and not that you shouldn't have a work-life balance. All of those things 100% are true, but you probably should work a little more than somebody who's been you know, paid their dues and in the business for a long time and has a lot of that knowledge already, you know, once you've reached a certain age and a certain level in your career and you now have other responsibilities, you have a family, you are helping more in your community, you are doing other things. Well, now it's time to rely on ideally the systems and the processes that you have set up, the knowledge and experience you have gained so that you can have a little bit more time, a little bit better work-life balance, a little bit less time working so that you can offer other gifts to the world, whether that's mentoring, volunteering, being with your family, supporting your kids, you know, all of those other things. So it certainly is a different message depending on the audience that I'm talking to. Yeah. All of these are like points to remember the next time we enter this conversation. Those are good points. I feel like all of these, like the, the CEOs, older CEOs, people who have built like brilliant companies, people like Elon Musk, Lakshmi Narayan, uh, Murthy, these people, the reason that they are so, you know, demanding of like, yes, work 12 hours, work, it's because when you work 12 hours, the output is so huge and so tangible and affects so many people. Like, in fact, the, the economy of an entire country that I think there is that factor at play that you forget that the stakes are not so high for the younger generation. And maybe that also affects 
just how much um, they're willing to give up themselves. I think so. I don't know. I, I mean, I think, I think it depends really, again, broad generalizations, yeah, right? Absolutely. I, I, I have no insight into what somebody like an Elon Musk believes about work. Some people might think that, you know, billionaire CEOs are just trying to get as much as they can to add to the bottom line and they don't really care about their workers and they're, you know, they're just trying to get as many profits as they can. I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak to that. I will tell you that I work with um, management, middle management and above at very large companies. And I work with smaller business CEOs, like in the 50 to $250 million range. And almost to a person, my experience with those people is that they truly care about their employees. They truly want them to be well-rounded humans who have time to be with their family. They want them to be dedicated to their job and do a good job at work, but not at the expense of their health or their personal lives, right? And and so it really is just a matter of how can we have both? And really what I believe is how we can have both is we, everyone, all of those busy professionals that I described need a workflow management or a life flow management system. To me, that is honestly the solution. If you don't have that, then you're working harder, not smarter. I hate that cliche, but it it really is yeah. relevant. True. So, so true. That makes me feel optimistic because I, as someone who I, I have anxiety, like I maintain a very healthy lifestyle, so it's not a problem for me. But on the days the anxiety is riding high, if you're unhappy with your circumstances, your environment, you're not going to be able to really show people what you're capable of. So, yeah, I, I feel like this is a very important conversation. And, yeah, what you're saying, it makes so much sense. We cannot ignore either sides. No considerations should be ignored, I think. I think we just need to take nuance into account. And we need we need to look at this the specific situation that we're talking about, even when I'm working with CEOs, they talk about, well, our workforce. And I'm thinking your workforce is 150 people, right? We can't put them all in the same buckets. We need to sort of break them down. We're not talking about everyone does everything what you're describing, right? And so so asking questions to dive deeper, I think, really is is the solution. Okay. Anything you would recommend to parents who are raising kids, anything they can do for their kid that would just help their kid be more productive as an adult so that they don't struggle so much? Yes. I think the number one thing that parents can do is to help kids manage their attention. So we talk about media literacy. I, I work with young girls a lot and we talk about media literacy and understanding that when you see somebody in a magazine, they don't really look the way they look. That when you see somebody on Instagram, that's not really their everyday life. That is just the life that they are projecting. And I think an important part of that, this media literacy needs to be expanded so that kids understand how they're being manipulated, but also that they understand that parents understand the reality of the situation. Like it's very difficult for you to tell your kid that they can't have a phone until they're 15. If that makes them ostracized at school because they don't have a phone, right? That's going to make it really hard. So Again, back to that, how can you make the things that you want easier and how can you make the things that you don't want more difficult? So, for example, how can you create an environment for your child where 
you understand the pressures that they have in an external environment, but can limit that in some way. So for example, one of my friends, they have a, she's 14 now, and all her friends, they, they weren't going to let her get a phone until I think she turned 12 or 13. But all of her friends had phones when they were much younger than that. And so it was so hard. And so their compromise was that they got her a watch, so a smart watch, so that she could tech. And she could be part of things, but she didn't have all the distractions of the social media and all the things of a phone. So that was a way. And another way is maybe to get together with your kids' parents and talk about how you can offer some solutions like when the kids are at your house no phones until 5 p.m. or no, right, or 30 minutes of phone when they right get out of school, but then they have to put their phones away and like be with each other. It it is not easy to be a parent these days. But there are ideas. There are ideas out there. There's a really good book that I recommend by Jonathan Haidt called The Anxious Generation. And in that book, he he's spent the last several years kind of researching this and talking about how to help kids and um, kids are not my expertise. So I would, I would highly recommend that book. Lastly, anywhere you want to direct my listeners to like how they can work with you. Yes, certainly my website is the best place to start marathomas.com. So we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Until then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.